specifically. All right. Okay, hello everybody. Let's do this. My name is Jerry. I'm from Wild Eye. Quick question for you by show of hands. Who was at my presentation in February? I think it was over here. See some faces? No. Oh wow. Okay. Let me try again. Um, how many of you follow what I do online? Okay, that hurts a little bit, but that's cool. We'll get over that. Okay, I'm going to do just one or two more for me to get some context here. How many of you have been to Africa on a safari in the last, I like it, the hand goes up immediately, in the last six months? You? Yeah? Ever? Okay, let's tra change this around. Who's never been on a safari in Africa? Okay, we need to remedy that, number one. Yeah? Okay, but we're all keen on wildlife and nature photography, yes. Okay. I walked past Madison Square Park. They've got amazing squirrels. They're incredible. They're huge compared to the things we get back home. Um, okay, what we're going to do today is I want to give you some food for thought for your nature photography, for your wildlife photography. We're going to do a little bit of an intro in. We're going to do a lot of example images, discuss thoughts and ideas. This is not a prescriptive thing. Creativity in photography can never be, you must do this. Joel and I just had a coffee up, up the street. You cannot do that. From a technical point of view, we can say f2.8 equals that depth of field and so on and so forth. Creativity is who you ask. It just depends. So, before we get going here, let's get one thing straight. Now this is, remember, my context, wildlife photography. I'll give you a bit of an intro just in a little bit. Before we start talking about creativity in wildlife photography, I need us to agree on one thing. Okay, because you use a slow shutter speed does not make you creative. People do this. Okay, so we're in the field and they're photographing the lions and then, okay, well, I can do something creative and they just drop the shutter speed down. Most often it's a mistake and they make a mistake with their photography, but it's not this. Another thing that it is not is that. Lauren and I spoke about this earlier in the week. Okay, people take a good wildlife image, they hit V on their keyboard in Lightroom, what does it do? It flips it to a monochrome view, they save it as fine art and they try to sell it. Doesn't work that way. Okay, there's a lot more that goes in to wildlife photography to build something creative. Okay, how many of you, just something, who's shot wildlife in the last week? Photograph. Okay, all right, context, getting this thing. Who would have liked to have shot wildlife in the last week? Okay, cool. All right, um, just a bit of context before we go into this. So my background is... Long story short, I ended up in lodge management. There's a whole career before then. And during gymnastics, which I did before then, I did guiding courses. So I went to do a mammal guiding course, birds and so on for Africa. And the thought was never to work in the industry. It was always something just because we grow up in South Africa. I could drive from Johannesburg one and a half hours and be in a big five game reserve, leopards, lions and all the wonderful things. So it's a part of what we do. Um, my wife and I started and we started managing lodges and they said, well, do you want to guide as well? Drive the car, show people stuff? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> duh, easy answer. So at that point, I did all the qualifications all the way up. So level one, level two, level three, for those of you that listen to the podcast, we'll talk about that later. Um, and then trails guide, which is walking. Guided for about nine years. And when I took over the last lodge, I started a small company called Photo Africa, which is pretty much wild eye what I'm doing now, but much smaller, it was just me. Photography, before that started, I was working in cruise ships, Queen Mary 2, stopped next to the Intrepid here a couple of times, pretty cool. Um, and when wildlife and photography met back in Africa, it just went boom. Started a blog, and it just kind of rolled from there. Seven years ago, we started Wild Eye with the idea of taking the intimidation out of photographic travel in Africa. There is still, unfortunately today, a big mis what's the word? stereotype to what I do. So just show me again, who's been on safari ever to a lodge in Africa, ever? Okay, old school says that the guide who drives you around wears very short, tight brown pant, very short, yeah? They have to have the biggest lenses and they drink beer every evening. It's like, yeah, real man's game. Okay, it was, ooh, yeah, I think I like that. No, you don't, you don't like that, that's different. Um, and it was, it was scary. If you wanted to go on a safari and take your little point and shoot, you, you were made to feel not welcome because you know, we frown upon your small lens type thing. Yeah? So we don't do that. So the idea with Wild Eye was to try and take the intimidation away. We run courses, workshops back home in South Africa. 
digital photography, Lightroom and Photoshop, and wildlife photography. Then there's set departure photographic safaris. This is where most of the stuff you're gonna see today comes from. And then private guided trips, where you say to me, we wanna to go to Londolozi for a week, I wanna work on slow shutters and black and white images. <laughs> and, um, and then we go from there. So all of the presentations and stuff that we do, all of the safaris we run is aimed at three things. Number one, experience. It has to always be an amazing experience to be out in nature. It trumps the photography, okay? Number one. Number two, you need to learn something new. People who judge the success of their safari by the images they get are gonna lose every day of the week. It just is this. So it needs to be the experience of wildlife photography. Okay, give me a nod or a grunt or something, yeah? Okay, we're good, mm, okay, cool. So the idea today is we're not gonna discuss and I'm not gonna give you hard set rules. This is food for thought. If, if you have a question, we've got some Q&A time at the end, pop a hand up and we'll check it out. But we're not gonna say depth of field and equal circle of confi and all this. We're not gonna go there. I wanna just discuss the creative side of the craft. Photography is a craft, there's a creative aspect. Okay, let's do this. Show of hands, how many people here shoot Canon? Nikon? Okay, if you guys can just split up then. So if we can just get the, okay, because it's a big thing, yeah? When was, when was the last time you went into a museum or a photo gallery or whatever, and you stand in front of this beautiful picture, and you ask one of the following questions. This is an amazing, amazing image. It must have been taken by a cannon. It doesn't work. When was the last time you stood in front of that same image and looked at this and said, this is an amazing image. It really is. That is some of the best ISO I've ever seen. <laughs> we don't do that. Okay. What speaks to us from a photographic point of view is the narrative, the creative. It needs to make me feel something. Yes, yes, there's a, a, a technical aspect that needs to be there. Always will be. And that is the foundation on which you are creative. And that's what we're going to go for today. So we are going to mention ISO shutter speed and stuff, but we're not going to go down that road. Joel and I, we just had coffee. I said that already. Hey, it was a great iced coffee. Yeah, it is. I mean, come on. Um, we spoke about it as well, and the easy way why people get so stuck on the technical is why. It's easy to break it down. We can put numbers on a chart, 2.8 equals this, da, 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 da. we can do that. You can't do that with creative, because it depends who you ask. But that's the fun stuff. Okay, so let's get into this. This is just, I'm, I'm fast forwarding a bit here. This is some of the presentations. We're doing a road show through the US next year. We'll be back here as well. Just read the continuum based approach to wildlife photography. I'll talk through it. This for me is the base of what we're going to discuss today. Right, what photography, and more specifically wildlife photography. You just want a proof shot. You just want to go home and say, oh my God, look, I saw a leopard. Yeah, you don't care if it's good or not. Yeah, so this workshop here, which will happen next year, is in development, there's a lot of stuff happening. Oh, sorry, just one more thing for you. If any of you want this entire presentation afterwards, email me, I'll send it off to you. So you don't have to write down or whatever the case is. So, just the continuum, right? This is it. So in the beginning, when you start doing photography, you just want to get a proof shot. You couldn't care if it's 100-pin sharp, if you cut the leopard's foot off, if the elephant is well in the ear. You can just say to someone, what a pangolin is. Yeah? Proof shot of pangolin, check, you're good. <laughs> okay, don't worry about the rest. Once you've got proof, then you move into the documentary stage. This, for me, as an easy description is, if you open a field guide to the mammals of Africa, you open the book, there's a picture of a lion's face. It's a document shot. It's not great, it's just good. Or lion from the side, profile. Yeah? You document nature. That's kind of where we all are most of the time. After that, it goes a bit further. The narrative. That is an image that asks a question. What is he doing? Why is he doing it? Now we get into an interesting place. It's interaction. It's implied interaction. A leopard stalking, if my frame is all the way to Seth over there, and there's a lot of negative space. My viewer is going to ask, what is he stalking? Okay, so the narrative is an important one. Now, majority of you, okay, show of hands, if you, be honest, come on, we're all friends here, safe place, yeah? How many of you see yourself in document now? Okay, maybe, Lawrence, maybe, yeah? Narrative, okay. Now, the next step from there on, is the creative. The catch with creative is it's high risk, high reward. 
That is specifically thinking, what else can I do here? Can I slow it down with a specific purpose? Can I crop it differently? Can I shoot it differently? Different focal lengths. It's the question of what if. Right. You will not, however, if we all go on a safari. No, not all, because that's a crowded game viewer. If, hello, Terrence. If only three of us go on a game drive, because we keep it nice and private, we're not going to get to an incredible sighting where there's three cheetahs busy chasing a Thompson's gazelle, there's elephants in the background, and there's a leopard in the tree. You're not going to start from the creative. You're not going to say, oh, let me try a slow shutter speed on this. It's not going to work. You're going to fluff it, right? You will start, you document first. We all pass proof. Nod. Yes. Jelly, nod. Yeah. Okay, cool. We all pass the... You document it first. Bank your shots before you start getting creative. Make sure you get the sharp image of the line. Then pull back because they could get up and leave at any time, right? Then you can start selling what story is here. What is he doing? What could he do? That's, this is normally this stage here for us is sitting on a game drive viewer. Lots of interesting discussions. What could happen if he goes here? And then you start getting more to the creative stuff. Okay. Now, again, show of hands, please. Now that Terrence is here. How was your train? Terrible. Good. Okay. We'll go for a drink afterwards. No problem. Okay. So, show of hands for me here. How many of you see yourself, if you had to choose one of these two, as a straight-up technical photographer? Hands up. Okay. Kind of half. Creative? Okay, it's an interesting thing. I did the same thing in South Africa a couple of weeks ago, and it was the other way around. People are so scared to call themselves creative because what does that mean? What does it mean? In South Africa, funny enough, who's been, who's been to South Africa? Safari or no? Right, our culture is very much like a man's man. You know? We don't do like the art stuff and the creative stuff. That's like for the girls. So very few South African guys tap into that creative side because it's not a thing. I shot with European photographers from Norway and the Scandinavian regions about five, six years ago. Big mindset change for me because their culture is based in art. They've got that whole culture coming through. Very different approach. We'll get there. Okay. So, breaking out of established patterns. What is the thing we always want to do? You want to bank the shot. There's a lot more to this. What is that? River crossing, great migration. Who's heard of the great migration? It's awesome. Okay. 0 0.4 second shutter speed of zebra and wildebeest running down the bank ready to cross the river on the other side. Okay. I've got, no jokes, more than 10,000 images of these crossings. They happen, some of them happen for four hours. These things just keep on crossing the river. There's crocodiles and lions. It's mayhem, right? That, however, is what it feels like to me. It feels like just this panic and these things running and stuff like that. We need to get to a point where we try to shoot what we feel, not just what we see. Big difference there. And a whole bunch of examples, and we'll have a bit of a discussion through them. With that previous image, in South Africa, a couple of weeks ago, on that previous image, on this, yeah? Hand goes up in the back. It's not sharp enough. <laughs> it's not supposed to be sharp. So that leads to this then. We do not need sharper images. There are enough sharper images. If you keep your shutter speed up, your images will be sharp. Okay. I had a guy in the migration trip last couple of weeks ago as well, funny enough, and he was trying to shoot. It's a stationary lion. Like, so like you're sitting over there, that's how still he is. Okay, this lion. And this guy's shooting two thousandth of a second. Thinking, Yo, he's a bit, no, 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 he's got his ISO up at like whatever, two million or something. And he's shooting this thing. Is it sharp enough? Then no, I'm going to make it faster. Sharpness is like being pregnant. It either is or it isn't. You can't be half sharp. You can't be half pregnant. Once you get to the point where an image is sharp, it doesn't care if you triple the shutter. It's going to be the same thing. Okay, we overthink these technical things. What we do need is better images. We need images that make people feel things. We need to... I, had a, I go down rabbit holes often, as some of you will know. Right? I was in the Kalahari. Anybody heard of that before? Kalahari Trans Frontier Park? Good place. Um, and there's a photographer, probably one of, personally, one of my, that I admire the most, Hannes Lochner. Look him up. Great guy. And he works out of the Kalahari. Used to. And he's got coffee table book in the shops. So I stand there with him, and he says the worst thing for him is he, he'll go into the shop. I don't know why he does. It's a bit weird. And he'll look at who looks at his books. And I'll check him out. Right? And he says the worst thing as a photographer for him is if someone picks up the book and they just go flick, 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 move on. 
They didn't appreciate the work that went into it. They didn't, no images stopped them. That's what we're after. We want images that are better, that can stop us. Yeah? Anybody know of Hannes Lochner? Look him up. Yeah, good, 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 good photographer. Really good guy. Okay, the photographic rut. This is, I'm going to show you in a bit. How many of you have ever been in a photographic rut? Hands up. Put my up, put two up. It happens. Where you just think nothing's working. I will never take another good shot in my life ever. It happens. Okay. At that point, what have you got to lose? Start playing around. Ask yourself, what if? What if is going to win for you every single time? What if I use a different lens? What if I half my shutter speed? What if I don't stand here, but I stand here? What if I jump while I take the shot? What if I lay down? The moment you start doing that, it stimulates the photographic voice and something good will start happening. There are two things. Hello? Two things. For me, in photography and creative photography, that stop people. God. Terrence is here now, so there's one extra. Who follows me on Instagram? Okay, keep your hands up for me, please. Who else has Instagram? Hmm, okay, we need to fix that. Okay, no. Risk. Social media has changed the game. We are so nervous of what we post. Admit this. For those of you on Instagram, admit this to me, because I know it's the truth. You post an image. Okay, nice line image. Post. Chatting, chatting, you. How many likes does it have? <laughs> and you go back every couple of minutes to see how many likes your shot has. Yes, yes, it's changed. So now we're starting to overthink the stuff we're putting online, because what if I don't get 2,000 likes? What if I don't get 10? Or in the old days on Instagram, for those of you who remember, if it's on 10 likes, and you, then you can click it because then it says 11 and your name won't show up. Anybody? <laughs> yeah, we do these things. Um, so risk. You need to be able to risk it and not worry what people are going to think. That's the biggest thing. People are so, there's, in the field, people show me their images. We work on it in Lightroom, in the media tent, wherever we are. And there's this incredible abstract colors of green or whatever. I don't think I'm going to post this. Why not? No, my followers won't like it. Are they paying you? I mean, is that why you do what you do? Risk. You need to move past and caring. It just, it just doesn't work. The second one is intent. There are time, times in the field when you'll make a mistake. Your shutter speed will be too low because you didn't pay attention to your ISO cases, and you're shooting this leopard that runs past, click, 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 and you think it's sharp. You play back and you think, oh, and it's this beautiful... Um, kind of blurry, dreamy thing. Okay, it happens. If you go out with intent though, if your intention is to create something else, you will win every single time. Mistakes happen, they do, all the time. But intention, in photography, have to try something. That's a big, big, big thing. So another photographer here, come on, click through. David, anybody know David's writing and books and stuff? Look him up as well. He's not a wildlife photographer, Actually, he's moving in. I met him in British Columbia like a week or so ago. Intent matters. The example for me here, if you want to write his name down, is we're on safari. We're all on safari. It's a big game viewer. Yeah? Safari. We stop and there's a lion over there. People pick up and they just start shooting. So, listen, whoa, whoa, what are you photographing? The lion. Wrong answer. It's not the lion. What is, what is the reason? Was it... The portrait, the regal kind of posture, was it the backlight on his mane? If you figure out what your reason is that you pick up your camera, your intention is going to be so much easier. Really, really makes a difference. Otherwise, it's, it's spray and pray. Grrr, oh, for the best, let's look in Lightroom. Use survey mode and find the winner. Not going to work. Okay. When we talk about the creativity side of things, composition. Okay, let's try this because this is always interesting. Hands up if you... Try to apply the rule of thirds to every single image that you shoot. Go, hands up. Okay, the rest of you, why not? It's a rule. It's the rule of thirds. You have to follow it. No? It should be the guideline of thirds. Yeah? It makes sense. For some images and for a lot of general stuff, it does work. There's a reason it's been called a rule. Okay? people leave a lot of good images on the table because they don't break it. There are times when you want to break the rule, if there's a reason to. If you break a rule just for breaking a rule, sake, that's just anarchy, that's just being anti-establishment. But if there's a reason, 
break the rule, take it away. Okay, so just from a composition point of view, don't use the rule of thirds always as your final and only go-to. Here's an example of a sighting we had in the Masamara. This is a good couple of years ago. This thing that's not clicking through, yeah? Okay, straight up wildlife image. Nothing special, yeah? It's a cheetah with a Thompson's gazelle. We watch this from start to finish. Composition. So if I do rule of thirds on this, the top line is kind of there. This is the focus. Yeah, it works. Is that the best image because of the rule of thirds? No. So, same sighting, a little bit later. That tells the same story. It's a story of a predator that's done something. How can I tell? There's some color. Yeah? So it's still, you know it's a cat, big cat. We know they punt. There's a bit of red in there. My favorite from the entire sequence was that. Talk to me about rule of thirds. Sorry? Oh. Okay, now talk to me about rule of thirds when I get back there. Click. Okay, so in this one, this to me is, okay, I, I don't even want to ask, it's going to hurt. Who listens to the podcast? Yes, a couple, okay. So we've spoken a couple of times about photographing kills. This to me tells the story, but there's no eyes. We hear often in wildlife photography, if the eyes aren't sharp, it's a bad image. I think this tells a beautiful story without going gory on it. Rule of thirds, maybe, I don't know. didn't matter and doesn't matter okay now this is the last thing before we get into some more examples here we need to start looking at the difference between okay remember you guys who check Instagram every five seconds how many likes you have what are the type of comments that people put down Wow with like 10 O's Wow <laughs> nice pick nice even worse nice click it was a click it's a photograph I made it nice click so you get all these comments, and we need to get away from thinking of an image as good and rather think of it as successful, because successful is kind of more objective. For example, if I go back to that cheetah image holding the, the Thompsons, is that a good image? Who thinks it's a good image? Some do, some don't. Yeah? That's cool. That's, that's photography. Is it a successful image of a prey in a predator's mouth? Yes. So if you start changing your mindset there, and you start thinking of, am I showing the viewer what I want to show them versus is this good? But Instagram always asks for good. Facebook asks for good. It has to be good. So when you start playing in this creative realm and you start doing different things, think of, is it successful? Am I showing a motion blur image of a cheetah running? There is zero sharp in the image, but I can see where it is. Is it successful? Yeah. Is it good? Depends who you ask. Mindset on the creative stuff, important one. Okay, so when you start going this route, what do I want to say and what do I want to point at? Um, the American author Anne Lamott said that for art to be art, it has to point at something. Makes sense. So what do I point at? This is a sunrise. It could be as simple as that. This is a sunrise. Or it could be this is what... So I think of what examples we have. This is what a blurry polar bear looks like because I panned him. What do you want to show? Figure that out and the rest will become a little bit easier. Okay. These first ones, I've got a whole couple of images here. I would like us to just kind of, you can shout it out, yes, no, maybe, or discuss. Are these images creative or not? But after each one, I will add in the X of info to see if we can get intent. Is that creative? Or is it just kind of a polar bear walking? What do we think? Anybody? It's okay. What do you think? Yeah? It's not bad. Okay. So let's see. 600 mil, 2,500 F8. That's safe shooting, yeah? Distance. 2,500, it's sharp. Nice. Okay. Let's dig deeper. Keep going here. Is that creative? Okay. That was lucky. <laughs> we, were, we were literally, I mean, this lioness was where Seth is. We were on the game viewer, and she was sleeping like half upside down. And we were playing around with depth of field. One of my clients, my, okay, so if you focus on the nose and you do this, da 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 yeah? And then she suddenly yawned. So I flipped it upright. Is it creative? Yes, because it's different. 
it's a different look and feel. Shutter speed, everything checks out, yeah? So there's, I didn't try anything too dramatically different with it. What about, is that creative? Did I have the intention of creating something unique here? Or, or anybody who was with me at the time would have gotten the exact same shot. So Wildebeest had just crossed the river, and yes, he did make it. She, it made it, crossed the river. But it's a very visual image, not necessarily super creative. I documented the moment. Let's check at the, so, whoopsie, sorry. It's a bear. Um, this one was, what do we see there? Come on. 800th of a second. So I didn't try and do anything funny. I was documenting. Not super creative. A lot of the time you can only shoot what you see, and that was one of those. Is, okay, I'm gonna have to uh, do this each time. Is that creative? Same question comes up. If you were sitting next to me, this is about five days ago, right? If you were sitting next to me, would you have gotten that shot? Yes. The thing was half dead. It was so chill, it was not going anywhere. We sat for about an hour and a half waiting for this bear to move. It did not. We, we tried a lot of creative stuff. Nothing worked, so that's why I'm showing you this one. Um, but there's nothing super creative here. This is shooting what you see. Let's look at settings. 600 mil. 250th f4. Why, funny enough, why only 1 250th? What does that tell you? I haven't got ISO on here. It's dark already. So I was pushing ISO up to like 6,000 and only got 250th out, but it's one of those things. But not creative. I, there was no intent to try something strange. Is that creative? Or, or, I don't even see you there. Hello. I like the cap. <laughs> Wild eye cap. Rocks. Okay. Or if you were next to me in the migration, watching the scene and you took the image and we process this together, would you have gotten that shot? Yes. Yeah. A little bit of processing, natural. That's what it looks like for those of you that have done the migration. It looks like that, but it's not overly creative. This is nature's creativity. I haven't gone out with the intention of doing that. I document. We'll get to the more interesting stuff in a bit. So, what about... A clicker that works would be nice. <laughs> I'll bring a better one, Seth. Creative or no? Or is it documenting what happened? You see where I'm getting here? Nature has its own agenda, its own creativity. None of these images thus far has been super. Look at the shutter speed. It's safe shooting. Fast shutter speed, big depth of field, nothing too dramatic. What about, is that creative? Or... Or if you were with me at Mala Mala or wherever, this was Sabi Sabi actually, and we did the spotlight shooting, would you have gotten the same thing, Deborah? Yes, you would have. Yeah? Same thing. Is, and this is the interesting thing for me. When I show this back home, for people who have more context, it's like, eh, whatever, man. It's a leopard. <laughs> I did, I did a, a presentation at the New York Times Travel Show, I think this year or last year, and it's people walking past, they're looking for cruise liners and hotels. You put up a lion killing something, it's like, oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. So with these kind of images, depending who you speak to and who you show it to, it looks amazingly creative. But let's be pragmatic here. That is, just, that is what it looks like if you sat next to me in the car. You're just photographing it, what you saw. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, another one. Talk to me about that. Is that creative? may be getting interesting now. Yes? Okay, it's a old oxpecker on a giraffe's kind of top of the neck. Got the whole one, or you zoom in tight. So now you start, there's more of a question here, what is it sitting on? So there's a bit more thought required from the reader of my image. I'm starting to go to an interesting place now. Shutter speed there, thousand. So in this case, it wasn't the technical side for me that made it creative. This was the composition, how I put the structure together in the frame. I do landscapes as well, once in a while, Terence. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is, <laughs> this is Svalbard. Anybody heard of Svalbard? Who wants to go to Svalbard? It's amazing. Okay, yes. Yeah, we're going next year, actually. Actually, both of you. Yes, we're going to have a reunion. That's awesome. Um, so, this is what it looks like. If you, um, maybe not with an iPhone, but any point-and-shoot camera can do this. 
you just take a pic. This is just making a photograph. It's just capturing a moment. It's not super, I didn't try and blur anything. Okay, what's happening here? Who has tried, I, I wouldn't recommend it, a tilt shift lens for wildlife photography? Don't. I thought it was an amazing idea. Last year, February, I got one. I think this was the Canon, is there, is there a 14 tilt shift? 24? Is it 24 something? Anyway, I got one from Canon South Africa or Nikon, whoever it was, and I thought this is amazing. I'm going to crush this industry. I'm going to just rock. Didn't work. Because it just, it's all of it. It's for converging lines and buildings and stuff. That's the best I got out of it. It looked like I put a lot of very bad Photoshop filters on this. Creativity, as far as I'm concerned, gone bad. Not great. Okay, but it's a good example. Uh, oh, yeah, 24 mil tilt shift and all the settings down there. Is that creative or is that just documenting what happens in nature? It's just documenting. The cool thing with wildlife photography, though, is there is so much happening that if you just document, it sometimes looks creative. We haven't even started trying to be creative. That's still coming a little bit later on. This is just documenting. Didn't make it, sorry. Tried, it was close, but didn't make it across. So if you look at the shooting as well, why, just from a tech point of view, why five thousandth of a second? Because that's prepping for what might happen. Because when those things make contact, there's a lot of very fast movements. We won't go into details, but it gets messy. Okay? And you want the fast shutter speed if you want to document that kind of thing. Not every reader. Is that creative? Talk to me. Now we're looking at a little bit more of a slow shutter speed. So here, what do we have? 640th, that is a Brunig's Guillemot. They are like bullets. I mean, when they take off, they, they swim all harm like a duck. And then suddenly when the boat comes closer, they just, they literally shoot across the water. We played with shutter speeds up to try and get to this point where some of it is still, face and stuff's perfectly tack sharp, but the wings and the, sh and the uh, on this was unbelievable. Loads and loads and loads. But the intention here was to get a bit of movement into the frame. So now it's going somewhere. What about that? This is a mistake. I made a mistake here, but I like it. There's a little bit of, okay, I don't know if you should see, there's a little bit of movement in the top part of the body. Notice for me, I think I've got it as a 24 mil. Okay, if you know your lenses, and that is not cropped, and you shoot on a 24 mil, we were sitting, and there was a little gap, like this tunnel coming through here. They were all walking through, so we had lined up and we kind of got the shots. And where you're sitting here, we're taking the pictures, you know in the movies how gorillas do this? They do. I found that out at close range, and he did a little mock charge thing at us. I pulled back because in 24 mils he was filling the frame, and I saw it in color. I thought, you oh, know, I'm not so sure about this because it's soft. It's not perfectly sharp. Black and white, and I actually quite enjoy the shot. Maybe, maybe it's because my life flashed. No, it's not that bad. Maybe it's because it was a special moment to me, and that's photography. It means something. I put this on my website at the end, so as part of my final trip gallery, that went up there. So a mistake can sometimes, sometimes help. It's scary though. Creative, so I've desaturated, bit of a sepia tone. It's just a different angle of a subject. One of the things, I'm not sure how many of you that have been on safari with me, we talk about deconstructing a subject. So as if you're looking at your squirrels in Central Park, or you're gonna do foxes or moose or bears or lions, whatever, often once you've shot the whole thing, it gets boring. You're like, oh, what else can I do? More, more. And you just end up with like 400 images of the same cat. Deconstruct the subject. Imagine for yourself, if you had to put a picture up on a wall, in the middle is the subject standing sideways, and you then had to surround it with eight square images of pieces of it. The foot, the ear, the nose, the tail, the trunk, the tusk, the mane. Now you start looking at it with a big lens up close. Now you start deconstructing things. It's a nice way. It's not super, super creative, but it's a nice way for you to start thinking goes over into animal behavior, but that's a very different discussion. Creative or no? Slow shutter speed. You can see there's an intent there. So this one came across the river in the migration. 60th. Ah, oh, man. Okay, that's also, but we'll get to that one next. So this was a 60th of a second. So off the bat, it's patterns. Wildlife photography is all about patterns and, and pattern recognition. You know, they're all coming across. We're sitting on the top of the bank. They're all swimming past here. You've got the, we've gone, we've proof, we've documented, we've done the story, the wide shots. Then go on an 800 mil, I think it was the Canon, 60 
60th of a second handheld, and you kind of follow these zebra through while they're swimming through the water. So that is intent. I wanted to get some water movement. How many did I shoot before getting the actual face sharp? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> Lots. So, but it just takes the one. It's a nice, nice thing with digital. Same thing here. This is low angle from a photographic high down looking up at the, the water holes basically where you are and they splash around. So you can only take three and a half thousand images of an elephant close up. Then you have to try something else. Hundredth of a second. So this is, if, if you can't recognize this, this is the face. He's throwing the water on himself, spraying back, tusk in the bottom. Intent. I tried something. What about that? Hmm. A lot of... Actually, was it here last time? Someone ripped me off about my zebra shots. This was on a workshop. So we stopped on the airstrip and we did the whole thing. We got all the zebra images. We deconstructed them to pieces. There's like zebra pieces everywhere. So then now try something else. This is intentional camera movement. We're going to break these things down in a bit. One thirteenth of a second. You threw on my zebra. You look great, by the way. And then just sweep across. Why does it work? You know it's a zebra. Please tell me you knew that was a zebra. Okay. No? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So there's zebra there, and then the green background. So in the, in the viewfinder, or on my screen already, I could see this is something cool. And then you do that. Zebra giraffe work very well for this. It's just creating something more. Play. Play wins. What about that? Is that creative, or is that just documenting a polar bear's foot? It's just shooting the foot. Close by, great experience. De deconstruct the thing in there. 600 mil, 800 F5. Creative or lucky? And yes, the frog made it. That's an elephant's foot behind it. <laughs> we were, he actually jumped into our hide. So at this elephant hide, I mean, and the frogs and the elephant, I mean, it was like this close. And he kept on jumping, jumping. I did nothing funny there. I just documented what I saw. Didn't do anything strange. Thousandth of a second. Why? Was I maybe thinking of something that could, could happen? Maybe. Maybe. But that, that's just being right place, right time. Shoot what you see. Ever says intent all over it. On the Chobi, you're on boat, so you're shooting very low angle up on the banks where the animals walk past. And the people were trying to pan elephants. Elephants, for those of you that have seen them, walk pretty slow. And when they walk, their heads bop up and down. It's got to do with anatomy, but we can discuss later. So it was too slow for them to get a proper pan. What moves faster? The foot. So if you pick up and you, you zoom in, focus on the foot as he walks and pan along with that, beautiful. Now you can get something. What was the shutter speed there? 30th. For those of you that are taking notes, that's kind of a good panning place to start. Anything from there down, depending on the subject. What about that? It's not creative. It was brutal, but it wasn't creative. These two knocked the crap out of each other. Badly. We did nothing funny. We sat back, we watched, and we photographed it. Hour and a half, elephant fight, insane, lots of memory cards, Amboseli. Those of you that are wondering. Not creative. Documenting nature. There was no intent for me to try something. Put it this way. There was no way in hell I was going to go to a slow shutter speed with that happening. Because it's something special. You don't see this every day to that extent. They literally wanted to kill each other. So I've banked elephant shots. I've banked all those things. That you don't see often. So then you probably won't go all the way to the creative because it's high risk. Bank first. Always bank first, but proper sighting. Same here. Is that creative? That's a spirit bear. Who knows what a spirit bear is? Incredible. It's a black bear with a double recessive gene. There's less than 200 of them in the world. We saw them about a week and a half ago. This thing was hunting where you're standing at the back. I was not going to try and pan or be funny with this bear. I was going to bank it. So that's not creative. That's nature. Can I get the idea? It's, it's a document first. Always, always document first. Shutter speed, one over 800. F4 because it was quite dark in the forest. Reindeer feet is best. definitely intent. I wanted to go slow. I've seen hundreds of reindeer. Who's seen a reindeer? They're quite sweet. Yeah, they're good. So panning the um, 1 over 30th. Again, there's the 30th number. Yeah? Okay. That. What happened there? Let me give you the settings as well. Two second exposure. We're on the Chobi. We've done everything. We've panned, we've documented, we've created, we've done multiple exposures, intention, everything you can imagine. So I say to Simon, who is my, my client on this particular trip, here's what you do. So there's three elephants, yeah? One, two, three. 
They all slowly walk. It's dark. I mean, the ISO here must have been four or five. It's pitch dark. I can't see a thing. And these things, they finished drinking on the bank, and now they start walking across. I said, hand hold your camera, dial in so you get kind of an even exposure, click, and just follow them along handheld. Not on a tripod, it's not a pan, it's that you just try and hold it, and it created this. Who thinks that's a good image? Hurt me, it's fine, I could take it. It's good, okay? I think it's amazing, because it's mine, so I should think that, <laughs> but, <laughs> have to. But from a pure capturing the moment, if you had to see how dark it was, to think that we can do that, that our cameras can do that. But what happens? Oh, no, the sun's down, I'm going over a thousand eyes, so let's put the cameras away. Mm -mm. Same thing, if it starts raining. Who shoots wildlife in the rain? Please put your hands up. It's amazing. It's the best time to photograph wildlife. What, what do wildlife things do when they get wet? They shake. Golden. So, yeah, this is, I, I thought this was quite amazing. Okay, now, some of them are creative, some are not. Now let's start looking at how we can try and do more different things. How many of you, if we were to go and shoot right now, if we get our cameras, Adorama all sponsors us new D5s, 1DX2s that we can keep, and we, and we go to Central Park, and we're going to... Sorry, Seth. It's all good, huh? <laughs> Boom. So if we had to go and photograph squirrels now, and be honest with me here, because this is the stuff we get on Safari every single day, how many of you would have to ask one of those questions? To get a shot, yeah? What should my ISO be? I don't know. What should my shutter speed be? Well, what are you trying to do? What should my depth of field be? Well, are you trying to isolate the subject or? If you go and look at our blog, I've got details all at the end, I've done blog posts with those names because if you have to ask yourself one of these questions, I'm gonna unfortunately say you don't understand your photography well enough. And that's where you're gonna leave a lot of good images on the table. I shoot in aperture mode. Give me an idea who shoots in aperture mode. Hands down, shutter speed mode. Hands down, manual. Okay, hands down, don't put auto. Oh, come on, come on, Joel, man. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. Okay, so if you understand ISO, in my mode, I shoot in aperture mode. I know that if I'm focusing on an animal, my shutter speed is too low. I can use ISO to pull the shutter speed back up. Yeah? You need to know these things. Before you're going to dig into the creative side, and using these variables to be creative, you need to understand them. So, let's have a quick, quick refresher here. Aperture. Okay, we know what depth of field is. Nod, yes. Okay, so I can skip there. Powerful tool that you have is also one of the most misunderstood ones. Okay, practically. I had a, a, a girl started working for us about four years ago. She came out of, she had, more, she had like a degree in photography, studio photography. So, she goes with us for the first time on safari, she's lost because things change like this. I'm here, there's a background, I move here, there's a tree, I move here, the lion's now behind the tree, so I've got to... She had no idea how to change that quickly because for most, most types of photography, it's very... There it is. You know what you're dealing with. You don't have to change every 30 seconds. So, I mean, you've been to safari. You shoot here, there's good light, there's bad light. Place. So you need to understand how depth of field changes. If I'm shooting, you're my, you're my leopard, yeah? The background's just behind you. You walk there, the background's not further back. It might require a change of aperture if you want to keep... Those things make sense. It has to be. So, just as a... Okay, this one I'm going to give you a better example. So you know, the red zone, the acceptable sharpness. F11 gives you a much bigger area of acceptable sharpness. F2.8, much less. Yes, nod. Yes, okay, cool. We're going to move past that one. So, the things you, for, for wildlife photography specifically, and we'll get to the examples now, the factors that decrease make, gives you a smaller area of acceptable sharpness are those things. Large apertures, f2.8, f4, yeah, gives you that nice drop background. A large focal length. The bigger you're shooting, four, five, six hundred mil, my leopard, the more out of focus the background's going to be with all the other variables in place. If I'm closer to my leopard, you're not, you're not the leopard anymore, you're not the leopard. So if I'm closer to my leopard, I can get more blur in the background. Yeah? And also, you're my leopard, not you anymore, so you're it again. The further the background is away, the more background blur you get. Why is this important? Let me just check here. I, I mean, if you, and if you increase the depth of field, then the opposite stuff is true. Again, guys, I can send this PDF to you afterwards, so that's all in there. 
This is the point. From Seth's point of view, he's photographing this line from that side. The focus point is there. Makes sense. That's going to be sharpened in focus, right? At F4, for example. Everything in front and everything behind will be out of focus. Now, majority of us only stick on one thing. We just want to get the background out of focus. Yeah, because that's cool. It like isolates the subject. I mentioned to you, I shot with a couple of Scandinavian photographers in Svalbard a good couple of years ago. And there's this Arctic fox den. It's ridiculous cute little nuggets like this, right? So it's up on a shelf, like a rocky shelf. We walk around and half of the people kind of go around that side so they get an open view of these two pups. And they're playing and it's all cute and just amazing and stuff. These guys actually went here. They went lower down in order to put something in front. Talk about it now. I'll show you one of those shots there. Soft backgrounds are great. So let's look at the soft backgrounds and why. Depth of field. So I've just got the stuff at the bottom. This would not have worked if both lines were in focus. Agreed. Because what do you want me to look at? Pretty simple. Soft background. I've got seasick shooting this image because it's on a zodiac doing this. Don't try it at home. It's not great. Um, but soft background. It's the ocean, but still, it makes that bird. If you still working? No. Soft background. Low angle, Lake Nakuru. Again, this would not be as nice or an impressive image if the background was any more in focus because it'll detract. Okay, so we're talking soft apertures here for the well, soft backgrounds, yeah? Being a little bit more creative compositionally, elephant with elephant in front. Low angle, the depth of field made possible because of a couple of reasons. I was very close to this one. The 5.6 give me the nice depth of field and a 330 mil. So that works. Yes? No? Who hates that image? Good. Okay. <laughs> Got to check. Okay. okay. So that's the easy part. We all know how to do this. Do, yes? Nod. You know how to do this. With your iPhone? With it, No? Okay. Cool. So there's the variables. But the magic for wildlife photography is in the front third. This is not a great image. It's not even a successful image maybe. But this is one I shot in a workshop. We had this lion. There's a lion in there. See it? Behind the bush. Mm -hmm. Nat Geo didn't publish this one, unfortunately. <laughs> so so um, we were sitting in a, in a, on, on a workshop, and the one lady's like, oh, no, she's done. She can't, whatever. So, okay, here's this. So you focus on something in the front, out of the back. It's just a different way of doing it, but just to show you in there. However, the front side. So by putting stuff in front, this, is, this was one of the little nuggets, Arctic foxes. By putting something in front, you're still focusing here, but you're relying on the depth of field in front of the image to do what? What is the most difficult thing to create in wildlife photography and probably normal photography as well? Is, sorry? Fr framing, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is a part of it, is depth. Creating the feeling of depth. If you always are just going to have your subject and a soft background, two dimensions. Now I start feeling like I'm a part of the scene because there's something then my subject, then something behind. I'm creating the perception of depth. That front third in wildlife photography is great. Front third, another baboon walking out, him and in the background. Yet, on the, this is on the Chobi as well, some people try to stand up on the boat to lose this. Sit your ass down, take the picture. This is great, you need that depth into the image. Slightly different, to impala fighting, okay? Focus on him. This one is out of focus, but it creates depth into the image and there's a background. Makes sense. You have to think of the front and the back. It's a big, big thing. Same idea. Who knows what that is? Kudu. Yeah? I'll tell you a joke about a kudu, but not now. Not for... Uh... Can I ask a question? Yes. So when, before you introduced the idea of the front third, yes. your apertures were very large, 2.84. Yeah. The last one was with the front third. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that generally what you do to include a front third, or could you include a front third at a 2.8 and 4? Oh, absolutely. Four? At 2.8 and 4, it'll just be much more. So this was, I was close to this thing. This is uncropped from 400, so it was kind of at the back there. Um, if I did 4 on this, then this, if it could be, even more out. And as well with the background. But yeah, always. Lower, more front and back. Yeah. Same idea. Just a little bit of a rock in front gives me the idea of something behind. This was horrible shooting conditions, but it sings. Who loves the dehaze slider in Lightroom? <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, try it out. 
um, any dust, clouds, mist, fog, whatever. But this was a little bit of a rock, shot that, and I've got this from a layer point of view, then these two, then this one, and then the bright in the back. The more layers you can create, more depth into the image. Okay. Take home, just on aperture. Again, I'll email this to you, no stress. The factors are important. Make sure you hit the focus point. If you do this front and back layer depth thing that Jerry said now, but you miss your focus point, not gonna work. Everything else is off then. Don't focus on the background, shoot through obstructions, like the lion, the non Nat Geo lion. There's better versions of that, but you can get that. And don't always shoot wide open. There's an argument to be made for five, six, six, three, seven, one, eight. Depending on your focal length, how close you are. I did an interesting, who emailed me there? I'm just thinking if someone's not here. No, it wasn't you, Deborah. Someone emailed me before a Mara trip and said, listen, they're thinking of buying a 70 to 200 2.8. They've got like the F4 version. They need to buy it. I said, why do you need to buy it? No, because I want to shoot a 2.8. Why? No, because it's professionals do that. Okay, well, okay. I said, here's what you do. Go and look at your Lightroom catalog, filter it down to just that lens, the 7200, and then check your apertures, what you shot at. There was no f4 and no 5.6 on that lens. Everything 6371. Why now go and buy a 2.8 if you're not even shooting down there anyway? I like, look, I like 2.8, make no mistake, we're very good friends. But um, it's not the, always the only way to go. Yeah? Any questions? Yes. Um, I don't think so. We can, we've got Q&A, so we'll, we'll probably try and get there, yeah? 100%. Okay. Oh, Starburst. I'll put this in just quickly. We all know how to do that, hey? Yeah? It's pretty cool. I mean, it's cliched and like a star on the streets or whatever. High aperture F22, wide angle lens, specular highlight, boom, you're done. Cool. Okay, moving on. <laughs> I mean, it's great. It's like, it's a thing. Okay, shutter speed. So, panning, motion blur, radial blur, and combinations of the above. When you start going with intent after your wildlife photography, these things can and do work very, very well. Thank you. Thanks, man. So, panning. We've all tried to pan, yes? Did it work? <laughs> no. Okay, let me ask you this. Your success rate on panning, that's the interesting thing. Because often, you shoot 200 and you might get one. That's pretty good. Pretty good. However, you're not going to post 200 on your Instagram, so it's okay. You just show one. You just need one. It's all good. Okay, so panning is literally a slow shutter speed. Find the subject while they're running across your field of vision. Click, 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 click. That's probably your hero shot. Click, click, click. But you have to pick it up and follow along. Okay, is that a good image? It's okay. Not bad. Is it successful? I think so. It's a rhino running. Panning. It can make any image... Okay, panning. If you've ever been on safari with me, you would have heard, I refuse to photograph Egyptian geese. They are horrible, they should all die. They are horrible things. Who knows Canadian geese? Same thing, but worse. Okay, so, so I apologize for putting an Egyptian goose image in here. Um, this was an Amboseli and there was literally thousands of these things just flying across. What do you do? Slow shutter. One over eight, and just go click, 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 follow along. It's visual, yeah? It shows birds flying. I wish it was an eagle, not that thing. Okay, hyena. Now, this, is, this, this was an accident as well. The hyena started at the back. It walked towards us and getting portraits. And as he came closer, you're kind of pulling back on my aperture. We know why, yeah? To pu Pulling back on the aperture. And as he came past, that just happened. So this is like an accidental pan, but still cool. Why would, you want to, why would you want some of this in your portfolio? Why? Variation. Thank you. Diversity, variation. If you only always have the same things, after a while, people don't care anymore. Diversity. It also keeps the experience nice and fun. Yeah? Okay, so then, elephant pan. Again, the foot. If you're ever on safari, watch the elephant's foot. The front foot specifically. They plant the back foot. You can see the back foot in the back. Back foot in the back. It's plant, and then this swings through very quickly before it slows down again. As a focal point right on the ankle, or with the knee, come across, yeah? Now, this was very intentional, obviously, but there's the thing. 
How many does it take? I had about four times that amount before we got one that worked. So you use survey mode. We know what survey mode is. Golden, yeah, for wildlife, golden. And you find your one. So there's the one second right top, finally. But the sequences for slow shutter speed, you can shoot a lot of those things. Now motion blur. This is something not a lot of people do in wildlife photography, funny enough, because it's difficult. And this is, so a pan is where you physically follow along with the subject. Motion blur is where you're, you are still and you allow stuff to happen in the frame. Okay. If you're in a game viewer with five other people, there's fighting because you didn't sit still and you didn't sit still. It's a thing. But also to hold still enough hand, it's, it's difficult, but there's definitely options. Something like that, subtle. What is that called? Necking. Giraffe's neck, two males. Looks very romantic, but they're actually fighting. Yeah? These things stand next to each other, and there's just the head that's going as they're fighting. It's pretty cool. So, slow shutter, wait for the best. Again, you shoot 10, 15, 20, but you allow them to do the movement, not you. Okay? Motion blur. Pack of wild dogs. Who has ever seen a pack of wild dogs kill something? Nasty. They, they took this little dacre. A dacre is a dwarf antelope that's a big. Small little thing. It lasted all of like two and a half minutes. Nothing left. They are vicious. So this thing bolted past the vehicle, Dogs came, killed it kind of with the back row sitting. Both, I had a private client, so we were on the vehicle, we balanced our, shut, our cameras, pushed down everything, one thirteenth of a second. This renders very well on a, on a, like a proper retina screen, but you got some of it visual, others. You can see what's happening though. Okay, I think the next one is also from there. So this one came out when it's almost finished, stood still, nice to have something stationary, and then the chaos continues in the back. Motion blur. Let nature do its thing. However, okay, okay, show me quickly. Who has not ever seen a wild dog kill? Okay, you've never seen a wild dog kill? No? Not personally. Not personally. Okay, Nat Geo doesn't count. Oh, by the way, Nat Geo Wild. Who watches that? Okay, there's a problem there. Not with you, but them. I saw now, a couple of nights ago at my hotel, I turned on Discover, uh, Nat Geo Wild, advertising a program on Africa's Big Five, which is apparently Lion, Leopard, elephant, rhino, and hippo. Who knew? Hippo is not part of the big five. <laughs> Buffalo is the other one. So I was a bit like, wow. Okay. And, but they always have to make it like super aggressive. There's this hippo running with its mouth open. It's like, rah. Anyway, they had it wrong. Nobody works for Nat Geo Wild here. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Hands goes up at the back. Um, so the nice thing here is if you haven't seen a wild dog kill yet, Anthony, the client who I had here, we've done this a couple of times. He comes out for wild dogs specifically. I'm not going to say to you, go slow. You're going to punch your shutter speed up, your ISO up, and you're going to bank the shots. Because there's very good shots, if you like that kind of thing, up close here to freeze the action. Not when you get it for the first time. Red-billed quilias, the most numerous bird in the world. They come to a water hole, we're sitting in a hide, and they just like smoke. It's like the starlings in Europe, same kind of thing. And they just go up and down of the water. Slow shutter, 30th. Some of them are crisp, some are slow, motion blur. They do the work. You get bored of shooting into the floor. Great migration, so on the vehicle, tell everybody to sit still, and you do your same thing. Sixth of a second, these things are just, they're thinking of crossing the river. So they're halfway through, they go back. It's painful. Sometimes it takes seven hours before they cross the river. This guy stood still for long enough to create something else. Now, did I get normal shots of that? Yeah, absolutely. This is the nicest one to me because it feels like there's movement. If they're all just sharp and crisp, Eh, whatever. You know what I mean? It's just do different things. You'll, you'll document first. If it's your first migration, when you come with me on your first migration, you're going to fill memory card after memory card of proof shots, because they're going to be bad initially. And then you're going to start documenting, which is the, the freezing stuff. And then we play with this. Then you look back when you do your third migration with me, and you go back and you think, what the hell was I thinking in the beginning? This is the good stuff. Don't, don't diss your process, but just be aware that there's always more. There's always more. Okay, radial blur. This is a strange one for wildlife. It does that stop. So it's, you zoom in tight, slow shutter, click and pull back. Gives you that Star Wars effect. Yeah? So for wildlife, it has its application. It's difficult because now you have to be super still and you're doing stuff. Um, Khalakhari, shutter speed, try and focus on the eye, pull out. Can work. There's one or two, who knows Greg the toy, photographer? Yeah? 
he has one image of a rhino's face up close and then pulling, it looks like a dinosaur because the eye is crisp and it pulls back. It's just another option for you to play with when you're out in the field. Easier with static stuff, bottom of a tree on the bank of the Thule River, literally pushing the camera up against the tree and then just clicking shooting blindly. There's a difference between taking an image and making an image, this making an image. Okay. This is the one that I quite like. The other ones are all like, nah, it's all right. These two, remember the running one from earlier on? This was one of them. They, it was midday, it was hot as hell, not as humid as this though, this is terrible. Um, <laughs> dying out there, it's horrible. Um, these two guys were fighting. So they would run around, chase each other, and then they would contact, boom. <laughs> you can see a little bit of red, this is the gashes from the horn as they're going at each other. So the idea for me was, we photographed this for days, li literally a couple of days, they were all in the same area. And the feeling was one, when they, when they hit, it felt like an explosion. They would hit and then pull back. That was what I was seeing. That's the closest I could get to photographing that feeling. Yeah? So they would hit and then pull back, and that for me was the only way. Hundreds and hundreds of attempts. Just takes one. And then, just, I mean, as if, if you do stars and stuff like that, this is also, I can't even remember what it was, Jataki Springs, I think. Random shoot, so you start in on a one second and just pull back, making images, playing around. I might not use it for anything. It's a good example, though. Yeah? Who shoots stars? Anybody like shooting stars? It's golden, hey? It's amazing. Go and Google Wild Eye How to Photograph Stars, and you'll have a blog with all the details step by step. It's pretty cool. Another guy who wrote it. It's good. <laughs> okay. So, combination. So now, you've got panning, you've got blur, and you've got motion blur. Why not put them together? What if we put them, what if we put them together? So, late afternoon, this ISA here must have been three, four thousand, if not more. Right? Sabi Sands on one of our seminars, it was the one before yours, Deborah, and these elephants were walking away from a water hole. So, we're trying to pan them because it's that kind of time, you just pull back a bit and then suddenly you get that. Is it everybody's cup of tea? No. Some people think, oh, that's goddamn awful. Great, great try, why not? Same thing. Late in the evening, this cat was just sitting there. It wasn't doing anything. That's what they do for 20 hours of the day. They do nothing. But if you start playing around, and that's the thing, is you get into a sighting, wildlife, whether it's your squirrel, a lion, or a bear, and, okay, he's not doing anything, which is wait. Okay, if that's the case, when he starts doing something, now what? Oh, God, what setting was I on? He's gone. You've missed it. If you stay in the game, and you're trying things, and you're aware of what is your settings at that time, it becomes a lot easier. Often, 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 we'll finish a sighting, amazing thing, people put their cameras down, we talk, we have a beer or a packet of chips in the car, and I'll say, what are your settings right now? No idea. But if you're busy with playing around, when the good stuff happens again, it's easy just to flick back. And you get stuff like this, which is pretty cool. I printed that very large, it actually looked quite nice. One, Joel, see I put a person in as well. Ah, there it is, man, travel photography, all day long. Masai jumping, you've seen them, yeah? Incredible height, beautiful people, amazing people. So again, 20th of a second, crunch down, they're jumping kind of where you guys, you're my Masai now, you guys wanna jump? No, okay. So <laughs> jumping up and down, so you're panning, you're pulling. So this is a pan and a radial blur at the same time. There's nothing crisp, you can see what it is. Does it show me what it feels like? I think so, yeah? Another river crossing from way back. This is like six, seven years ago. If you've seen the migration, they'll stand on the edge of the river and then suddenly go. It takes one, wildebeest are stupid, but it takes one of them just to go. And that's what it felt like to me. So, one over four of a second, started on the end, it was a 200, 400, Nikon, it was, and they twist weird, if you hand hold it. So, zoomed in tight over here, and then as they started running, pull back and pan at the same time, that's the result. It is a good, is it a good documentary shot? No, it's not. Is it to me what it feels like? Yeah, that's the kind of thing. Okay, so on shutter speeds, just some ideas. Again, I'll email this, no stress, don't worry about it. Play, this is the most important thing. Then, intentional camera movement, who knows what that is? Yeah, Terence, you and I have done that I think, hey? Yeah, so literally where you go slow shutter speed and you do stuff, make circles, or you do zigzags, do you know where it started though, funny enough, where it kind of got a thing? I think it was Japan, Tokyo, art students got little point and shoot cameras. They would go to the middle of the town, town, 
It's Japan. It's a city. So they went to the middle with this camera, dialed in like three seconds, and threw this thing up. Turn, 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 catch. Look what we made. Intentional camera movement. Don't try that with wildlife, though. But um, so the idea here is literally painting with light. All that is is a red bush willow with sun from the back, fifth, one fifth of a shutter speed, and making little circles while you take. And you don't go click, not gonna work. Grrr, and then look after it. It's making, it's painting with light. It's making images, not taking them. There's my, moving on, my zebra picture. <laughs> Try the same thing with a moving leopard, why not? Because we've got all, oh, we've got hundreds of leopard shots, yes? Nod? No. Okay, no. But why not? It's dark already, your shutter speeds are already challenged. While this thing's walking away, 1.3 second shutter speed, just shake while you shoot. It's a thing. Same with this. It's a giraffe standing at a water hole at the end of the day. You get there, you bang out a couple of sharp images, and then what? More? No, not more. Do something different. Fifth of a second, little circles. It looks like something a kid would draw. Does it make a nice addition to a portfolio? Yeah, I'm not gonna make a whole portfolio of this on my website. Actually, might be something there. Okay, move, yeah, I'll think about that. But it's a nice compilation, not adding into the bigger picture. Intentional camera movement. Think of the nature of the subject. Leopard is stalking, do not worry about people. Don't worry what people think. If you get five extra likes or less likes on Instagram, you're gonna be okay. Not a problem. Okay, multiple exposures. Who's played with that in camera? Not Photoshop layers. Multiple exposures in camera. Who knows, who does not any idea what that is? Okay, so what it is, this for the hands, is in camera you set two up to 10 depending on your camera and those frames, so I'm gonna take picture, 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 it overlays them, it gives me one file. Okay, in camera, multiple exposures. That's one of them, that's five shots combined. So the wildebeest and the mara there are shitloads. They're everywhere during migration time. Everywhere. So that's what it feels like sometimes. You look at this and you think, how do I actually capture this? It's all over the place. Straight into what was shutter speed. It wasn't slow, fast. But into a group and just making small movements. Go click, 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 click. And it merges all of those and it gives you something like that. Again, this is what it feels like. To me, what it looks like. Makes sense? Great way to do it. Guinea fowl, this was in a workshop, this is nine shots. Guinea fowl, for those of you, if you ever get lost in the bush, you probably won't use this, but if you ever get lost in the bush, these things drink twice a day every day, morning and evening. So you sit at a water hole, they will come down to drink. So, and they're panicky little things. They're like chickens on steroids, they're like completely, or Ritalin or something, I don't know what it is. But, they'll, and the heads just pop up and down as they drink. So, we put our cameras down on a bean bag and you just take nine shots it was, Overlays it, pump the clarity and the saturation, and there's something. I would never ever use an image of a guinea fowl. They're very close to Egyptian geese. Very close. But this is something else. Okay. Same thing. Zebra crossing the Mara River. Six shots, same scene. Because they're moving, this is not slow shutter speed. This is multiple exposures. So this is me holding it still. And while they're doing their chaos, you just go click, click, click. In camera, boom. There it is. It's different. I think it's nice, yeah? Same thing here, giraffe. There were 12 giraffe in the scene, right? Four shots, Some, so there's a ghost one here. So they were, they were like a whole bunch necking in the middle and then the other one's walking past. It was, these things are very difficult to photograph. Giraffes are phenomenally difficult to photograph. Unless you have them in context far and a beautiful African landscape, they're just like there. Well, there, they're very difficult to photograph. So this became interesting because we were far enough that with all the swinging and everything, we could do multiple exposures and create something different. Now, this one is a bit of a combination of two. Uh-uh, uh-uh, come back there. Okay, it's a herd of zebra. We could see that, yes? There's two shots in here. The first one was a slow motion sweep, click, change the shutter speed faster, click. So what you're seeing, the crisp stuff is the sharp image. The sweepy ghost stuff is my other slow shutter speed that's been overlaid. Does that make sense? It's different. 
The reason we tried this on the day, this was at Kaburu Crossing in the Mara, it was windy as hell. I mean, it was just blowing. And someone said to me, right, smart guy, how do we photograph off the wind? Fine, this is what we do. So it looks to me like the zebra are blowing away. Possible. Not possible for them to blow away, you know what I mean, right? So you can, in between your multiple exposures, change settings. One slow, one fast. Three fast, two slow, whatever. Nice to change it up. Um, this also, I think, is two shots. So the one was a slow panning image, and then immediately afterwards, just a sharp one, and it gets stuff like this. Again, this is making images, not taking. There's no right and wrong. It's just fun. One giraffe, five shots. One giraffe walking past the scene. So, again, pattern recognition in wildlife photography. This thing was going to walk past here. Put the camera down on a bean bag, and on five images, click, wait for him to walk a bit, click, wait for him to walk a bit, click. That's what you get. The original image, so that's out of camera, that's raw. So, same giraffe, five times. It's different. Who's tried that with a squirrel? Admit. <laughs> Nobody? Come on, man. These things, are, they're huge though. African squirrels are like, yeah, big. Very strange. Okay, multiple exposures, just play with it. That's really as easy as it is. Now, just to kind of link it together, creative thinking processing. Who uses Lightroom? Show of hands. Hands down, Photoshop only. Hands down, anything else? Capture one. Yeah? Okay. So, during post-processing, just to keep in mind for you that during post-processing, the eye, the human eye is attracted to certain things. Brightness, saturation, and sharpness. So, I do this thing in, I think we did it the other day with Lightroom. Close your eyes and open. What is the first thing that draws my attention? In my scene here, I'm drawn to that Nikon case because it's the brightest part. I'm not drawn to the back because that's out of focus for me, right? So in your post-processing, using brushes, creative, however you decide to process, brighten certain areas, saturate them, and make them a bit sharper. That'll draw my eye to it. On the flip side, the following will push the eye away, the push pulls, visual mass, yeah? Dark areas, desaturated areas, and unsharp areas. So whatever you photograph, like those giraffe, those, the one five giraffe thing, how do I process that? I bring him a bit forward, I push the background back. Now you're thinking of dimensions, yeah? Think how you can shoot. A lot of the time you have to shoot for your processing, but don't rely on it. For those, no, hold that. <laughs> Go past. Okay, so this is the thing you need to ask yourself always out in the field. What if, when you get to a sighting, whether it's a spirit bear, polar bear, or a lion, bank your shots first, get them, boom. Then start thinking, okay, what can I try now? Don't arrive there and start multiple exposuring. It's gonna end badly for you. Bank your shots, then work from there. Okay, question time. Anybody, any questions? Yes. Okay. First one, do handheld or tripod? 99% of the time, handheld. Whether we're on foot or in a vehicle, um, always handheld. The problem with a tripod or even a monopod in a vehicle, and some vehicles, if you've seen, if we're all driving on the left hand side, they've got these mounts where you can bracket yourself in. Problem is, now we park like this, and the leopard, which started here, walks around. Now you've got to tripod your way around because you don't move the vehicle all the time. It's easier handheld or beanbag. If you have a badger bag, those ones that kind of go over the vehicle, that works very, very well. But yeah, tripod very, very seldomly. What was the other question? Okay, and how do you set your settings, especially in a simple place? How ah. do you change? Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a standby setting where I will always be, so I'm in aperture mode, so I'll always go F7.1, and I'll be at about a 250th to 500 somewhere, just depending on the light, because there, that's a big bug. Um, because I can tap and shoot, I might get a proof shot if the pangolin runs across the road, but it gives me one dial either way on my, on my aperture to either get more light or then close it down. So that standby setting, a lot of, I mean, F8 can be there, you've all read that somewhere, but I find 7.1 and kind of a 250 to 500 works quite well. Mm. Okay, aperture mode for me is the most, aperture, depth of field is the most creative thing we have in wildlife photography. 
is being, if you're a herd of zebra, you look great by the way, so if you're a herd of zebra, I can focus on you and blur the background out on aperture priority. As long as I'm in aperture priority, I can keep an eye on the viewfinder and make sure my shutter speed is fast enough versus my focal length. But the other way around, it becomes more difficult because I can manage now, I can just manage my aperture and keep an eye on shutter speed where the other way around, there's more things to manage. See, shutter speed, I think you might have, in the beginning, it's either sharp or it's not. So the difference between 500th of a second versus 2,000th of a second on a static animal is zero. Whereas the difference between 5, 6, and 7, 1 is quite dramatic. So I just find the more creative tool for me is that aperture mode. Yeah. Yes. Good question. <laughs> um, I mean, you get things like panning plates and all those wonderful things. Most of the time, I mean, 70% of the time we're in the vehicle, but it would, it would literally be just brace in hips and turn from the hips. So it's most of the time handheld. Um, the interesting thing is a lot of areas, East Africa specifically, the, the horizon's on straight. There's, there's all of these layers like this. So animals are often moving up and down. So you, you have to be able to go up and down. That's where the panning plate sometimes struggles a bit because you can't do up and down. But yeah, it's <laughs> um, like just pure will and determination. Try and keep it as smooth as you can. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So when you're panning or when you're trying to do uh, like three-dimensional you know, field work, yes. are you using like a single point focusing and are you locking your focus as you move as, mm -hmm. as the subject is moving or as you're moving? Sure. So on panning specifically, where would you, if, if I'm an animal walking across here, where are you going to focus on the pan? Not on the head. People still think there's a bird this in the frame, I've got to focus on the eyes. No, it doesn't matter. On an animal, so what I will do, I'm always an AFC or continuous focus, AI servo, depending which language you speak. Um, so on a pan, what I would try and do, because you're going to pick up the animal, well, for all of us, pick him up over there, he's going to run across, this is probably your hero shot, and then he keeps going. Shoulder. So I try and hit the shoulder because most, an most animals, bears actually as well, Actually, Kuna, how much of it? Two African animals' movements that move like a bear. Anybody? I saw this now recently. If you combine how a hyena and a cheetah moves, you get how a bear moves. It's quite interesting. Anyway, so focus on the front shoulder, because that's where the mo locomotion comes from, and that's normally the one point for an animal that moves in the flat line. If you go on the head, there's up and down. Elephants can't walk without moving their head up and down. Their muscles can't sustain, so they have to lock the leg and that's why there's the head up each time as they lock the leg. Shoulder point, I'm always on AFC um, and back button focus. So either just dial it in, keep it in, or focus, recompose, and shoot. But I'm always AFC or AI servo. Sorry, Canon. Yeah? Anybody else? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. are, you, are you doing that because you're willing to accept some noise to get a specific mm. view? So I'm not sure. No, no. I can fix noisy, I can't fix blurry. So I will always try and hedge myself. I would rather over. I, I must be honest, I'm very bad. People all the time, ISO this, that. I'll kind of. I mean, the easy answer, as you know, sun is down, ISO is up, sun comes up, ISO goes down easy way to remember it, and then vice versa. But I end up going, we started like 16,000, 16,000, goodness, no, 1,600 in the morning. I normally get to 800 midday and I just leave it. Because I think if you know what your camera is capable of, and if you're comfortable to remove the noise for that particular ins, then I'm good. But if anything, I would always overcompensate. Because noisy I can fix to a certain degree. If it's out of focus and blurry, I can't do it. Yeah. Oh, sorry, say again? Lenses. Yes. Lenses you use? Ooh. If I only could take one lens, 70 to 200. Every day of the week. 70 to 200. Yeah. So that has to be for the so I... No, because she wanted it for the 2.8. That's the only thing. I, I could have said to her, here's a 1 to 22 mil 2.8, and she would have bought it. It's whether it's polar bears, bears, gorillas, that is the first, and not because, it's not because of the 2.8, it's because of the focal length. You can get very good animal and environment shots or close-up stuff with that length. Um, second up from there, probably 200, 400. I had to choose one up. 
and it, but it depends. If you come to East Africa, you need 400 plus. It's a much bigger place. If you come to Southern Africa, then 300 more. You can, you can use the big things, but you don't need it. Yeah? Yes. There is that. There's also, <laughs> good question. There's also that, so at the office we have a rental stock. So I've got Nikon and Canon gear. Nikon, sorry. Nikon and Canon gear. Um, and how I normally do it is I will look at the clients. If it's a private guided trip, there's a lot of interaction. And I'll say, I know you're shooting with the Canon. Or what do you shoot? Nikon. Nikon. Okay, so bad example. So I'm going to shoot Nikon with you. I then take, I don't own a camera. I haven't for years. I take whatever rental stock I have that matches close enough to yours so that I can speak better to you and help you in the field. The 500 stuff just happened, I think it's the last two years, the 200, 400 was booked and there was a hub. So I ended up with a 500. That's really the case, yeah. But... And you're able to handle that and get... That's why I go to gym. That's the only reason. No. That, that was the 500 F4. Yeah, that was the F4. Yeah. I mean, the 200, 400 is golden. That really is a cool focal length. Um, the, the one, I had a lady who came on Safari two or three years ago. She brought four camera bodies. Lens attached was a 600 mil uh, Nikon, 600 mil, 200, 400, 70, 200, 24, 70, and then she had another wide angle, the 14, 24 in a bag. She missed most of her shots. Why? The lion is like, oh my God, where do I start? So I would, I would, if anything, 70, 200, 200, 400, you're done. One body. one body could work. If you have two for that, that's great. Because if you're going to swap to a wide angle, then stuff is slowing down. If the times when you want to go to a wide angle, generally the animals have settled, they've killed, they've whatever they've done, and then you have time to change it. But the action stuff, normally you want those big lenses. Yeah. I, funny, funny enough, I always have them, the 1.4, um, on the 300 specifically quite a bit, but you know, not too much. No. I just find, here's where I'm coming from. So I have the 70, uh, 70 to 200. Yes. And I have a 1.7 Nikon. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, it gets real. But what am I trading off? Mm. You see, the, there's the whole thing. There's more glass for the light to pass through. So there's a certain drop in quality, blah, blah, blah. Chances are, if you had to shoot it well, settings-wise, light-wise, and you process it well, and you show it to someone, will they be able to tell? If your answer is no, why bother about it? A lot of, a lot of people overthink their photography to the nth degree, they miss shots, they... So, if you're happy with it, done, go for it. Yeah. The, the more I read about it and hear about you know, creativity, it seems to be divided where people feel, people are saying, uh, pre-visualize, don't pre-visualize. Okay. So, is, is shooting with intention the same thing, would you say, as pre-visualizing? I think it's close, I think it's linked. Um, pre-visualizing for me, specifically with wildlife photography, is... Like, I went to shoot bears for the first time now. I've done polar bears for seven years. This was my first time going to British Columbia. So, what I would do then is I would look at images like Ian McAllister, um, who's the other guy up there, Paul Nicklin shoots a lot up there. I would go and look at their images to get an idea visually, to kind of have an idea of the space I'm going to be shooting in. The background, what can I expect, low angle up, what lens choice and so on. And then I watch videos of the animals, documentaries if I can find them. Because if you know how an animal moves, you can shoot it, photograph it. Um, but, but, so, so for me, pre-visualization is more about understanding the subject, which in wildlife photography is 90% of the game. Um, people often, when they come to Africa for the first time, is how am I gonna photograph elephants? I'll send them a list of documentaries, go watch this. Go watch this BBC thing because they talk about how they walk. That pre-visualization pre -visualization for me is more about the subject and knowing how they move. And then in the field, the intention of Right, I know how they've moved, I've photographed that, now let me try something. So I think one leads to the next, if that, if that helps. But with wildlife photography, behavior is, is everything. It's everything. One little paw up, 
you, you know, I've done that. Literally, if you shoot a sequence of a lion walking, they do this sweeping movement with their feet. If you pick the wrong one, it just doesn't look great. So there's a big, the, the pre-visualization is around the, the subject for me. And intention is how I'm gonna capture what I've pre-visualized. Yeah. Back to your basics from the uh, initial part of the presentation where you have proof, document, narrative, creative. I'm trying to distinguish between document and narrative. Is document more direct and, and uh, narrative mm. more indirect? Do so, yeah, so document would be, this is a lion. It's not doing anything, it's just standing there. Right. It's a good, what you would find in a field guide. Narrative is he's doing something. There's, there's more to it. There's something called Flemin, the Flemin response, when they lift their, their um, top lip up and they show you the jaws, the jaws, the, the canines, um, mating behavior, hunting behavior, funny positioning, anything other than just a normal lion shot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So blood for me injects a question is, ooh, what did he eat? Type of thing. So the idea is next year, that specific one, I'm, I'm starting that presentation series in November this year at our wildlife photography seminar. And then next year, we're doing a road show, New York, Boston, a whole bunch of places, with that whole thing. So it'll be developed more. But also, blogs, podcasts, you'll see a lot of more of that stuff coming up. Because, I mean, you know, you know Paul Nickling, you nodded earlier on. Paul Nickling's work, yeah? Who's got his PDF from Craft and Vision? He's got a good ebook out on wildlife photography. His approach to the whole thing is 20 60 20. So when he gets to a new sighting, 20% of the time is documenting the subject. This is a spirit bear. 60% of the time then, he shoots and says, right, how can I make this different? Narrative. And then the last 20% is just be stupid ridiculous. Let's see what happens if I hand hold this spirit bear at midday and 20 seconds exposure. So 20, 60, 20, but it's the same kind of thing. Um, he doesn't shoot much proof shots, I think. <laughs> uh, not like most of us. But yeah, that, that would be the, the idea. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. you, depending on the area, if you know the area, you could follow the animal to where they often dip some stuff in. So you could park well. Alternative is tell your guide to park further away. Often, what's the first thing we want? Get us take a picture of the lion. You know, okay, bad. It looks like aerial photography, which <laughs> sucks. If you pull back, if you put the lion over there and you use your three, four, five hundred mil, it almost negates it. You can get to the point where it almost looks like eye level if you're shooting longer. So I would pull further back, away from the subject, and also use the environment. Drive, because we can go off-road in most places. Go and park on that tree, up, up on that termite mount, or in a dip, whatever the case is. Yeah. Um, when the animals are moving, that's where local knowledge is important. If the guy's moving in a southeasterly direction, you know he's gonna get to Pakalani Pan. At Pakalani Pan, there's a nice little area at the bottom where we can shoot for him there. But the biggest thing is pull back. Immediately pull back, it negates that angle in a nice way. Yeah. Anybody else? Cool. Yes, sir. Best part. Super park in India. Ho! Oh. Hey, there's a tough one. Um, it's like asking which, which dog do you love most? Rocky, by the way. No, I can't say that. I can't say that. Um, if you're going to go on one safari ever, I would say Masamara because of the density of animals and just the quality of shooting. If you said any more specific, I want to photograph leopard, go to the Sabi Sands. If you want to photograph wild dog, Go to Tuolu, elephants and baseli. But as a once-off, Masamara. Con uh, East Africa. So, so the Masamara ecosystem sits, Masamara Serengeti is like a pair. A pair, yeah? The top bit is the Masamara in Kenya, and the rest is in the Serengeti. When? Did you say when? For, oh, for the migration. For the migration, it happens up top there from end of July through beginning October. It's now. I'm up there about a week's time. Um... But you can go to the Masamara anytime, just for general good shooting. Um, Feb, March, we run trips all the time. But for the migration? For the migration, July to October, yeah. August, September is kind of peak, but the last couple of years, the whole thing has shifted earlier on. It's been moving. Because actually in a while, they did live in July. Mm. Safari Live is still going, yeah. I get Twitter, every day I get messages on Twitter saying, hey, I saw your vehicles, because we've we got a camp up there. Oh, you saw your vehicles. Safari Live's great. Um, different discussion, but they do good work. Yeah. Yes. What's the other migration? Serengeti migration. Serengeti migration. So, are we good for time? I can keep talking, eh? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> throw me out to something. Um, 
So the migration, we all know the great migration, yes? So it's basically, if we turn around, it's 12 o'clock around to 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock is the Masamara, and they go in a circular movement down to the southern plains of Serengeti, which is in Dutu. That's where they give birth. And then they come back up to the top 12 o'clock. It's about a 900 kilometer journey around. I've done both. The energy in the Mara is much bigger because of the river crossings and the amount of predators. The Serengeti is great, but there's no, you need cats to inject that tension where it's in the Mara, it's there. In the Mara, it's like, are they going to cross? Oh my God, no, he's not. No, no, he is not. No, he's not. And then the crocodile comes in. But in the Serengeti, it's a lot more, I want to use peaceful, but there's lots of death with, I mean, cheetahs, young, hunting babies. If it's not your thing, don't go there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's just the river crossings make it dramatic. If you look on the blog, um, look on the two sides of the Great Migration, where I compare the two with images and stuff as well. Yeah. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, do we shoot? Not for wildlife specifically. If I shoot stars and slower stuff, maybe. But the type of images you're kind of going for, there's just so much happening that, I mean, I said to Joel earlier, I've bought this camera. It can do cool stuff. I'm not going to buy a Porsche and drive it at five miles per hour. So I'm relying on my camera to do what it does. And I want to just, for me personally, control the aperture because that is the variable for me that makes a great or a not great image. But there are times. I mean, sometimes that, for example, the, the light there was ridiculously difficult. It was backlit, everything was glowing and you're struggling. If it's, excuse me, if it's a static sighting, absolutely. I'll slow down and go to manual. But it happens quick like this. Most of the time in aperture. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. So, I'm gonna leave you just with this. For the creative stuff, it goes because of your Instagram accounts. <laughs> that don't worry what people think yes exactly you can go like your own image on Instagram if you have to but it's fine <laughs> yeah okay any questions all right so um, before we wrap up the next slide has contact details I also have I'm not sure I have enough but I've got a whole bunch of these things for those that are keen right it is a wildlife photography tip sheet that we give out on us for now. There's not enough. Now I'm going to be in trouble, hey? Okay, here's the deal. If you don't get one, email me. I will post you one. If you're going on safari in 10 days, can you get <laughs> Which company are you going with? <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. I'm the crazy person who contacts you and is driving herself. Oh, <laughs> really? You, you, you get two. It's amazing. <laughs> um, you wanna, so, but seriously, guys, if you don't get one, Take my email, um, hello, take my email and I will post you one. I've got 500 of these at the office. So it's literally on each safari we give these out. It's very basic. You can put it on your camera card, on your camera bag. A um, bit of information. It's literally scenarios, wildlife portraits, what to look for, shallow depth of field, blah, 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 blah. So there's a couple of those. Um, I'll put them out now. And then for those of you that want to get in touch, um, wildlife website, I'm on Instagram, Snapchat, everything, same name. Um, podcast, blog, YouTube videos. There's a lot of stuff out there. I know there's like three of you that listen to the podcast. Thank you so much. It's amazing. Um, anyway, thank you so much for coming out. And I'll be around if you have any questions. Thank you.